Uh, so as I said, I'm Scott Fallman. I'll be talking about uh, the cascade correlation algorithm today and a couple of related things. And uh, this is arguably, but people do want to argue, uh, the first deep learning net. Uh, depends how you count. But uh, you'll see what I mean by that. So what I'll be talking about was published in 1990 and 1991. There are two ancient papers on it. Uh, if you just Google Fulman Cascade Correlation, you'll find those papers, or you can access them off my homepage. Uh, there's a little bullet that says publications or neural net publications or something. And you can uh, click on and find these papers there. Uh, they were both published in the, uh, what we're supposed to call it now, the Neural IPS Conference. Uh, at the time, it was called the NIPS Conference, and that is now deemed to be improper. Uh, so, uh, so all of you know about deep learning. You know these these old guys back in the 1980s figured out how to do backpropagation, and uh, some of them won the Turing Award for for, for that work. Finally. Uh, it was very promising. You could do little problems. And we were running these on single processor workstations, staying up all night to, for the stupid thing to converge on, on what today would be trivial problems. Uh, but you know, machines are a thousand times faster than in those days. And, uh, and that's without the GPUs. And what really caused it to explode around, what, 2012, 2013, was that people realized that you could take these networks, and you could run them much faster on GPU chips and uh, other arrays of very fast numerical processors. And where before we might have a network with two layers of at most 50 or 100 units, uh, now of course you've got billions of parameters in the network. And because, thanks to the internet and people uh, collecting things, uh, scraping the internet, we've also got data sets that are millions or billions of cases. So that's deep learning. But way back in 1990, 1991, we were doing deep learning of a kind. And that's what I'll be talking about. At the time, uh, well, the time I developed this, Jeff Hinton had been here for a few, few years. He had just left for Toronto. So I worked with him on some of the early backpropagation. Actually, backpropagation was invented. A lot of people invented it. but. When Jeff invented it, it was in the next office. And uh, the Boltzmann machine work was going on there, too. And I was kibitzing a bit. I won't take credit for any of those things. But uh, uh, we did collaborate a little bit. So I kept working on neural networks for uh, up until the mid-1990s when the money completely went away. And I had to go do other things. And uh, then who knew it was going to make a comeback in the uh, 2010s? Uh, at the time, I was worried about two kinds of problems. One is that there are all these fiddly parameters. You've got a problem. The first thing you do is have to guess how many layers and how many units in each layer, and whether it's totally connected, whether you're using what these days are called residual connections. We called them skip connections. Uh, from earlier layers, not to the next layer, but farther into the net often all the way to the output. And that does speed things up, but it's more parameters to tune. And we had to do things like guess the learning rate. If you guess wrong, if you have too high a learning rate, you were just shooting right past the answers and sloshing around and wasting a lot of time. If you had too low a learning rate, you're creeping, creeping, creeping. And it takes 10 times as long as it should. And if you're staying up all night waiting for the stupid thing to converge, you don't want it to be 10 times slower. So how do we guess the right learning rate? And that's what this quick prop work was about. Uh, so you had a, had a talk on that. Basically, you make two simplifying assumptions. One is that the space you're in is roughly second order quadratic. Roughly. It's an approximation. OK. And the other connection is that all the all the weights are being trained separately, but they don't interact much. So the fact that you've decided you should take a step 
of a certain size on one dimension should not be radically wrong just because you're changing another dimension at the same time. Okay? So quick prop was this idea of fitting a, a parabola through two gradients uh, separately for each parameter you're tuning and then jumping to the bottom. That won't be perfect because these are simplifying approximations. Uh, so you have to go through many cycles of that, but at least you're not guessing learning rates. And it doesn't have to be the same learning rate for every parameter in the network. Okay, so that was quick prop. And that sped things up by like a factor of 10, and that was really cool, uh, I thought. Uh, and, but damn, these things are still too slow, and you still have to guess the size and shape of the network. It's even worse now because you have to decide how many convolutional layers and merging layers and so on. But even when it was simple layers of feed-forward units, uh, trying to guess the right size of the network, there was just no theory to help you there. Okay, there still is not. There's not a good theory that will tell you what size network you want to, you want to use. Okay, so as Big Shaw said, people uh, get some network that's much huger than they need. It takes a long time to train it, but we have the GPU chips now. It's not so bad. And, uh, but there must be a better way to figure out what size and shape of network you need. And there were a couple of problems that, that I was focused on. Let me get back here where I can see my slides. Uh, so I came up with this cascade correlation algorithm. Uh, the idea is to build, to start with no hidden units, inputs, weights, and outputs, and then one by one add hidden units until you like the answer. Okay, you'll see that in much more detail. But the idea is to build just as much network structure as you need. No need to guess the size of the network before you set out. This solves some problems considered hard at the time, 10 to 100 times faster than standard backprop, uh, even with quick prop. Uh, we ran, this all ran on a single core 1988 vintage workstation without a GPU. Uh, so it did take hours for some of these things to converge, now it would take milliseconds. But, uh, you know, we were able to attack some harder problems than anyone else was, was attacking at that time. We never obviously applied this to the huge sorts of data sets like uh, all the image data sets and so on that, that have been collected uh, or huge amounts of speech or natural language data. We just didn't have that. It was way beyond the capability of our networks. But I was worried about why are the stupid backpropagation networks still, still too slow? and uh, came up with a couple of ideas. The key observation was that if you've got a layer of hidden units and they're all learning at once, they're interacting. They really are interacting. They're all learning at once. So this one here, I tend to like to get into the mind of the unit and see what it's seeing and what it's trying to do, right? What it's being told to do by the feedback. So if you think of it from the point of view of a given hidden unit, I see some error over there. I want to adjust my weights and get over there and cancel that. But you know, it's a big high dimensional space. But uh, everybody else is moving at the same time. So this error that I'm trying to get to is, is moving around because everybody else is tuning their, tuning their weights and canceling part of it. And there's something else that happens called the herd effect. Suppose you have a problem that can be solved well by one hidden layer with 10 units. Okay, you need 10 units. Well, what does that mean really? There are 10 different jobs to do. And if you do all 10 of those, then you've solved the problem. Okay, there are 10 components of the error, 10 nonlinear functions you have to create in order to have the right space that the output layer can, can zero in and solve the thing. Okay? And the problem is there's no central authority saying, okay, we've got 10 components of error, unit number one, you're gonna deal with this one. You know, they're all just, oh, where's the error? Okay, there's some error over there. I'm gonna go over there, it's the biggest component. And they all see the same error at once and they all go thundering over there. 
Now they're starting from different points in the space, right? Random initialization of the weights. Okay, but they, they all see some error signal and start converging on it. Somebody gets there and that component of the error goes away. He's canceling it now. Okay, and they all say, oh, what happened? I was coming over here, but now that error is gone. Well, okay, here's the second biggest. Let's go get that one and they all head off that way. Meantime, all that initial variability is wasting away. They're, they're clumping. We made some displays and they were clumping more and more tightly in the, the space of maneuver. You could only look at very small networks, but we could see that happening. So the herd effect, you've got all these random hidden units and they start converging. And by the way, when we start going after the second component of the error, the guy who's, who just nailed the first component, he doesn't know he's doing anything useful. He sees this, he's, oops, now this is back. Now let's go over here. Oops, it went away again, let's go over here. And little wonder that it's awesomely inefficient. Okay. Uh, you really either need a central authority that says, look, there's 10 jobs here. Here's what each of you are going to do, and there's no way to do that that I could think of. But what you could do is train the units one at a time. Okay, unit one, you can, you can go uh, pick some air, nail it down, and then stay there. Now unit two, uh, now you go find some error to cancel, and so on. So that was the inspiration for uh, the cascade correlation algorithm. I'll explain why it's called cascade and correlation in just a second. Oops. All right, so this is the cascade architecture. And this is a little, this is just a perceptron basically with three inputs and two outputs. Okay, each output has this nonlinear function at the end. Okay? So uh, the red dots here are, my pointer went away, so this is the pointer. Uh, the red dots here are tunable, tunable weights, right? And the vertical lines are just summing the inputs from all the input lines through the tunable weights, okay? You see what I'm doing there? It's a little different than the way we usually draw those nets, but there's a reason. Okay, so this, and what you can start with is a unit just like this with inputs, weights, nonlinear units, and outputs. Okay, train it up as well as it can without hidden units. And it'll do a little better and then it'll plateau. Now, that plateau may not solve the problem. It may not be good enough. Minsky and Papert proved that there were large classes of problems that a perceptron with no hidden units could not solve. Okay, this is the famous perceptron book that came out uh, 1969 or so, about the time I was entering grad school. Uh, and people had been trying to, trying to solve hard problems with networks that look like this, bigger but with, with no hidden units. Uh, I was working for a NASA lab one summer and they were trying to detect cloud spirals. Well, that's the hardest thing you could possibly try to detect uh, in, in satellite photos, you know, to see if hurricanes were forming. And that's the hardest kind of thing you can try to do without hidden units. It's just very difficult. Uh, so, okay, we've trained this up. It improved and it stopped. It's not good enough. Now what do we do? Well, now we can add hidden unit. Suppose we train this unit here offline to do something useful in the network, plug it in, and by the way, we're going to freeze it so it doesn't go wandering around. So we train up these weights initially so that this does something useful. I'll explain what that is in a minute. We put it in the network and we freeze these weights. He's doing something useful now. We don't want him to go anywhere as we further train other units. Okay? And then that feeds into the output. The output weights all get retrained, blending this into the total output, and it should do better. Okay? Better, but not necessarily good enough, so we might need a second hidden unit. And while we're at it, why don't we let this second unit look not only at the raw inputs, but at the output of this guy? So he can build a more complex feature. 
has all the original inputs and now all the units that are already in the network listening potentially to all of those. Okay. Train that unit to do something useful, put them in the network and freeze them. Okay. And then, by the way, we train the output weights again to blend that all in. That's very fast training. It doesn't, it's only one layer deep. Yeah. So when you add this uh, second hidden unit, yes. do you freeze the, the weights on, on the output side? Uh, the red weights, you add a unit and then you train all the red weights there, okay. going to the output. Uh, so yeah, you, you retrain all of these because what you're trying to do is blend these five available features now. You're in a five dimensional space and you're trying to find the best point there. And then it'll be a six dimensional space. We very routinely got to 15 or 20 or 30 hidden units, which was a network with that's 15 or 20 or 30 units deep. Layers deep. Okay, so this is deep learning. It's just that each of the layers is mighty narrow. It's just one unit. Okay. But as you will see, we can build some pretty complex uh, detectors, some pretty complex features. So to review, we start with direct I.O. connectivity, no hidden units. We train the output layer. Uh, if that solves the problem, if the error is now acceptable, we declare victory and go home. Oh. And it's surprising how many data sets that we got from people in industry didn't need any hidden units at all. They were using these big complicated networks. They didn't realize that the problem was really linearly separable. And they didn't, or, or maybe just one or two hidden units added by Cascor. Okay. But anyway, see if the error is acceptable. If so, declare victory and go home. If not, Create one new hidden unit offline. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, we create a pool of candidate units. They're not talking to anyone else. They're looking at the inputs. They're looking at the residual error propagating back from the outputs. They're trying to correlate with the residual error as well as they can. We're maximizing a covariance measure as seen by each of these units. Now, they're not connected to the network yet. They're looking at the inputs, they're seeing what the residual error is, and they're all competing to cancel, to correlate with that. And if you can correlate with the residual error, you can cancel some of it once we plug you in. Might be positive or negative correlation, but we can put you in the network, freeze you, and cancel some. So we just took a bite out of the residual error. And you can do it again and again and again. This is the same idea that was later reinvented, and they proved some theorems and called it boosting. Okay, you can do use a combination of many imperfect uh, classifiers uh, to produce one that's, that's much better. And you keep working on the residual error. Okay, so you get the general idea. Now the pool could just be one unit you're trying to, but these things do get stuck in funny parts of the space. So we found it more useful to have like eight units and train them all at once and then pick the winner. Okay, the one who's got the best correlation score. When we do that, we tenure that unit and plug them into the network. Okay, now I use the word tenure advisedly. Uh, you pick the one who's doing the best. He's now in the network and everybody has to listen to him and the others all get massacred. <laughs> okay, throw them away, start over. Okay, just like in a university. Uh, some of you are gonna end up as faculty members, remember this. You're a hidden unit right now. Uh, once you're tenured, you're in the network, we freeze your weights, you never have to learn anything again. In fact, you can't, <laughs> okay, because you got tenure. Okay, you're doing something useful and you just stay there and keep doing it. Uh, so that's what this algorithm is about. Any questions there? Yes. Right. Uh, so the question is, you have all these candidate units trained up. You pick the best one, throw the others away, but isn't it worth trying to salvage some of the ones you're about to throw away? And the answer is yes. You'll see, I, I mentioned this on a slide of variance that could be looked at. If you've got three or four units that are not correlating with each other, but they're correlating with the error, it's worth putting all of them in. 
if they're redundant, they've all learned the same thing, all the well, good scoring ones, then you only need one. There's no point plugging in more than one. So if you've got unique units that are correlating with the error, unique meaning they don't correlate with one another much, then it's worth, it's worth putting in more than one. So you can get some leverage there. You can, you can train faster. You can skip some additional training. Uh, yes? Oh, you guys are getting way ahead of me now. Can the candidate units have different sizes? Uh, I'll come back to that. That's one of the variants I'll talk about at the end, but it'll make more sense once we... Okay, so part of the answer is you could, if you wanted to, have candidate. The question is, uh, in the candidate units, are they all necessarily the same, or do some of them look at different sets of inputs or have different activation functions? And uh, what we can do is put in the candidate pool units with different input spaces. We can put units that uh, have different activation functions. For example, a Gaussian activation function is picking blobs out of this high dimensional space as opposed to putting a, a line through it. Okay, so you could have some uh, sigmoid units or ReLUs, but if you have a ReLU you can't use quick prop because it's not doubly differentiable. Uh, and you could, have some, uh, you could have some Gaussian units and you could have even some very exotic units that are looking for very particular things. And whoever gets the biggest bite of the air, that's the one you tenure and put in. Okay? Yes? Uh, what do you mean about fast scan? I mean, what do you mean about fast scan? You maximize, as you're training them, uh, the training algorithm is trying to maximize the correlation between the candidate unit's output and the total residual error. If it's, if it's correlating well with, with the residual error, then it's useful to put it into the network. And the one who's correlating best is the winner, has the highest correlation score. It can be positive or minus, but the highest magnitude of the correlation score. Yes? Uh, there's a formula at the end. I, li I like to avoid formulas, but I'll put one up at the end. Uh, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's push forward here. One bad thing is there's no clock visible to the speaker, but... Uh, If you say so. It's rude to look at my watch all the time, but I may do it because there's no clock I can see. So one, uh, what was considered a hard problem back in the day was, for example, the two spirals problem. So you have two linear inputs, or two uh, floating point inputs, the x and the y coordinate. And you give it a bunch of sample points that either want, either say produce white here or produce black there, produce a one or a zero. Okay, so you're classifying points in this two-dimensional space according to which spiral they are on. Okay, and you're giving it a dense enough set of points that it's pretty clear what the spirals are. There are not a lot of other interpretations. Okay? So this was considered a very hard problem. And we gave it to cascade correlation and it built a network uh, often with 12 units. This is a 12 unit solution. We had everything from 10 to 16 uh, hidden units. Remember, that's 10 to 16 layers also. And this is the output it produced. It's a little bit shaggy. Uh, we could give it denser points and it would get rid of some of these leaks. Uh, but that's a pretty good solution. It got all the points right, and it just wasn't generalizing as well as you like. Quite. But it's very close. Okay? Well, so, how does that compare with the state of the art at the time? Okay, we didn't have leaderboards and all that stuff, but uh, people had tried this on a standard network with two inputs, three layers of five units, totally connected, and one output. Yes or no? Okay? And it took 20,000 presentations of the entire training set, which is all those black and white points, a couple of hundred points, 
and there was one billion link crossings. In other words, it, it's hard, you don't want to measure clock on the wall time because your machine's faster than mine, you know. So the measure we were using for speed was how many multiplies. How many times did you multiply a weight times a, an input? Uh, I call those link crossings. And then you can kind of translate that into speed on different machines and so on. Okay, but this is the raw amount of arithmetic that has to be done. There's some other stuff going on, not just link crossings, but this is the dominant cost. Okay, so standard backprop, 20,000 epochs. Same network with quick prop was disappointingly only twice as fast, but faster. Uh, with CAS score, it was 1,700 epochs instead of 20,000. Uh, and on a smaller network. So uh, it had 20 million link crossings, so it was 50 times faster than, than uh, standard backprop and 20 times faster than quick prop with a fixed network. Okay, so it was a nice speed up on that. And it uh, basically ran until it solved the problem. It solved it. What was the upper table? Oh, the upper table. Uh, I ran this a bunch of times and this is the histogram of solutions. So most commonly it would find like a, a 14 unit solution, 14 or 15. Okay, uh, once in a while uh, the planets lined up and it got a 12 unit solution. Uh, other people have tried this later and they were getting uh, 11 and 10 unit solutions uh, by letting the thing run a lot longer before you declared quiescence and plug the unit in. Okay, there's a patience parameter that says how long do you want to wait around when it's not improving much. And if you just tune it very hard, you can get... And by the way, the smaller the network, the less shaggy was the result. The closer, the better it generalized. Not surprisingly. You've heard about overfitting, right? Okay, so that's, you know, that was nice. That was a good improvement, I thought. And the other thing that was kind of cool is that you could see what filters you were building. Build a little display thing. Okay, scan through the, scan through the uh, space. And it would tell you for each unit what its output was. So this table shows the initial, as you, no hidden units, your training was zero units. Training the input to output layer. And that was, you're getting a hard one, a hard zero in between somewhere and a hard one. What's it doing? It's, it's saying, well, all we can do without hidden units is get this slice and say it's definitely black and this slice here and say it's definitely white. Okay? So now let's train a hidden unit. And what it comes up with, I wish I had my pointer, uh, what it comes up with is uh, a unit that looks like that. Okay, it's slicing through that two-dimensional space. And if you blend that into the network, retrain the output, you get this. Well, it's sort of getting this outer layer, but now it's getting this, which is pretty densely white, and this, which is pretty densely black. Uh, the next hidden unit puts a little jaggy in it. It can build a more complicated thing. It's not just a, a line through the space, not just a separating plane, but it's got a jaggy in it because it's looking at that first nonlinear unit. Okay, so it's able to do this, and now it can get that, which captures more of the points. Okay, and then it gets really exciting because it's starting to build hooks. It's starting to build spiral detecting units, at least for the core of the spiral. Okay, now people are always whining that in deep learning you get no explanation. Stuff's going on inside the network. You have no idea what it is. We can see it. A little bit. Hidden it's, units. It's it's in this is in a unit in in a space where it's seeing the two original inputs and the outputs of hidden units one through five. Okay. So it's now able to produce this somewhat more complex shape. If you look at it in six dimensional space, if you're good at imagining that, this is just a plane through the six dimensional space. But. Uh, Four of, those, four of those dimensions are already kinky, are, are nonlinear combinations of the original inputs. Okay, so it's making hooks and it's doing better and better.
and then uh, after a while it's kind of grabbing patches. It stays symmetrical because it's a very symmetrical problem, but it's grabbing patches that it was missing before. The idea of building more and more complex hooks in a very orderly way, we're now down, it's, it's much smaller component of the error and it's kind of grabbing chunks. So you can still, it's still building sky, spirals up to here, but now it's grabbing some crazy thing to add on. And it's doing better and better and better until finally it gets that picture I showed you at the, at the top. And that picture is getting all the points right. It has solved the training set. It doesn't generalize as well as you might like. We could give it more points. But that's a good solution. I mean, it's not going to get any better with that training set. Okay? So what are the advantages? No need to guess the size and topology of the network in advance. It's doing it. Now, it's not finding an optimal solution. It's a greedy algorithm. Okay, it, but not guaranteed optimal, but it's pretty damn good. Uh, it can build deep nets with higher order features. You just saw that. It's much faster than backprop or quick prop. Uh, quite frequently, we would see a hundredfold speed up on the problems we were looking at. With today's problems, maybe we'd get a thousandfold or a millionfold, who knows. Uh, but we have to get all this running on all the GPUs in the world and, and so on, which we haven't done yet. Uh, we tried doing this in TensorFlow, and TensorFlow did not like you changing the topology of the network in the middle of training, thank you very much. And it fought us tooth and nail, so we're looking at some other options. Uh, it trains just one layer of weights at a time. It's either looking at the candidate pool and training just the input weights to those candidates, which are not interacting, or then you're in the output layer training phase and it's just training those outputs, those things that were red in the, in the earlier diagram. Okay, so it's never back propagating error through multiple units and training things deep. It's just training, a, and that's very fast, it's just training a single layer. Okay? Now the candidate training can have local minima, that's why we use a pool. There are places it can get stuck. It works on smaller training sets, at least in some cases. We saw that uh, in a bunch of problems. Old feature detectors are frozen, not cannibalized. So there's this idea of curriculum training. Let's give it a simple problem, train it to do that, and then take that same network and try a slightly harder problem. Slightly harder problem. And the trouble is it, it starts grabbing units away from the thing that was working on the simple problems. We don't do that. Once we've got a hidden unit in the network, we nail it to the floor, it's not going anywhere. Okay. So you can give it some new, you can even give it a few couple of totally different problems and it'll build some units and solve that, but it hasn't cannibalized the original units. They were useful once upon a time, they're going to stay useful, leave them alone. Okay. And this is very good for parallel implementation. When we're training that candidate pool, those units are all trained, they're all hearing the same inputs and they're hearing the same uh, residual error values, but they're training separately. They don't have to interact. They can be spread across 100 machines. Usually, back in the day, it was like only eight guys in the training pool, but there could be hundreds. Okay? Ah, uh, you say, well, that's all right for static input-output classification problems, but suppose we want to do sequences. Uh, standard backpropagation is combinational logic. The output is a function of the current inputs, right? If you want to do sequences, you've got to put some kind of memory in the thing. Okay? So what's the simplest possible modification this is the recurrent cascade correlation paper, which was the next year. What's the simplest kind of memory we could put in the thing? LSTMs hadn't been invented yet. Okay. Uh, what if we took the output of these hidden units, put them through a one-step delay, through a trainable weight, and fed that back along with all the other inputs? So there's a self loop. And if this weight is strongly positive, you've made a flip-flop. If it's positive, it wants to stay positive. Unless the other weights all gang up 
and wrestle it to the ground and say, no, you're going to flip. And then it stays negative. Okay? And if this trainable weight is negative, it wants to flip each time unless something holds it down. The other weights conspire to hold it. Okay, so this is basically a bit of memory, one bit of memory. It has a continuous value, so it can, sometimes we catch them doing more complex things. Uh, so we can train these things up uh, just like CAS score units. While we're training the candidate pool, we're training this weight as well as those. The formula for its update is a little different. That's in the paper, uh, differentiating the residual error with respect to the self weight and getting a gradient and, and tweaking it. But that's, that's the simplest possible modification of this architecture so it has some memory. We thought we would have to go to much more complicated things, but maybe this would be good for something. And one of, yeah? It's part of the unit that we create and put in the candidate pool and train. The question is where, where ex when exactly is that feedback loop added? And it's just there with each of the units from birth. Okay? Now, if the network doesn't want, if it needs another combinational unit, it doesn't want one with memory, that just self weight can be zero. That's what it will learn if that's the right thing. Okay? Well, this is a test a lot of people were using to show that you could do some sequential pattern recognition, and it's called the Reber Grammar. And the idea is you make a diagram. You don't show the diagram. There's no way to show it to the network. Okay, this is just how you generate strings according to this grammar. And the strings are what you show to the network. But this grammar says B, and then you got a choice. Maybe it produces a T, and then maybe an S and an X. Another X, a V, P, S, E, we're done. Okay? So we want to show it a bunch of strings generated by this grammar, and then we give it some new inputs, also generated by this grammar randomly, and it's supposed to predict the, predict the next unit. Or if there's a branch or some ambiguity, it might say, well, it could be this or it could be that, and two of the outputs come on weekly. Okay? But what it's basically doing, this is unsupervised learning. We're just giving it these strings, and it's trying to produce the next. It's kind of supervised, I guess, but it's seeing these strings, and it's just trying to produce the next element in the string. Okay? That's what we're training it to do. And a lot of people were trying different, different architectures uh, to do problems like that. Uh, a fellow named Jeff Ellman, uh, who at the time was at UCSD, I think he, he still may be, uh, the Elman nets had a fixed hidden layer and it took the whole contents of the hidden layer and that along with the units was the input to the, the network next time. So it took the whole hidden layer and put it back and that plus that's what it was training on. Usually at the start of each sequence, at the start of each string you zero the memory but after that it's, it's looking at the previous state. Okay. Well, with the Elman net, fixed topology, single layer, three hidden units, they actually did learn this grammar once. They showed it 60,000 distinct strings randomly generated by the grammar, uh, once each. And the best run, not the average, did learn the network. Now, they were in their paper not terribly clear how many didn't learn it. Okay, but it, it could learn it. It did learn it once, <laughs> at least once. Uh, with 15 hidden units, it's much easier. You only need to show it 20,000 strings out of the grammar. And that, again, was their best run. They didn't, didn't say in the paper how many times they had to run it to get that one that worked, how many times it got stuck. So not my favorite paper because of that. What we got, threw it into recurrent cascade correlation, that architecture I just showed you. And we gave it a, generated 128 training strings. We thought, well, let's try it on this small set. See, we certainly won't be able to learn the whole grammar from that, but it did. Uh, we gave it 128 training strings presented repeatedly, 
and it learned the task building two or three hidden units, two or three bits of memory. Okay, that's just enough to encode where the hell it was in that graph, basically. Uh, it took, uh, well, in those days it was pretty slow. 200 epochs passes through the 128 training patterns. Now, if you've looked at current neural network problems, they're bigger, <laughs> a lot bigger. Uh, so we presented 25,000 strings in all to train this thing, okay, which is smaller than the Elman net which we're doing. And in our case, uh, it always learned them. And uh, it tested perfectly always on new unseen strings, so it really had nailed the model. Okay? So that, that I thought was pretty cool. I do not. And back in the day, we didn't have huge file stores, and I had like 10 megabytes of storage on the Andrew file system. There were a lot of notes from that period that, that are lost now because I had to keep deleting things so I could. <laughs> so I, I thought I kept them on some uh, disk or something, but it's long. So I have to reconstruct that because I really want to know now exactly what it was doing. Uh, yes? Previous slide? Yes? Yeah, marching through the set, starting over 128 times. Yes, an epic is going through that whole set of 128 strings in this case. It's going through each of the strings once, and the, each one, you know, is presenting some number of inputs, like 12 or what, whatever those strings were. So the average strings, I think, in this case were eight or nine. So it was eight or nine presentations, and give me the predict the next one through the string, zero the network out, go to the next case, and do that whole set of strings 128 times. Uh, this was sufficient. We could. The question is, uh, why show it a small set of strings? Why not give it more novel strings each time? You know, thousands and thousands of them, instead of going through the same set. It was easier to set this up. It, it was sufficient. It learned, uh, so we didn't need to generate a bunch more uh, inputs that were that were novel. I'm sure it would have worked just fine if we'd given it, you know, 10,000 novel strings. But that's a, an experiment somebody could run now and find out. Uh, so as I said, it learned the task, and, and to our surprise, it only needed two or three hidden units generally, never fewer than two, uh, and tested perfectly, generalized perfectly to new strings it had not seen from the same grammar. So then you gave it a harder problem. This is the sort of thing that people use LSTMs for now because we start, we give it either a T or a P, and then the whole body of the Reber grammar. And then the last thing, instead of just exiting, it's got to produce the T or the P, and then so the string starts with the T or P, all this other stuff at the end, instead of just saying E end, it produces the T or P at the end. The same one. So it has to remember this all the way through. It has to learn that the first thing it sees, it's going to remember until the end. And by the way, there are T's and P's coming out of the, the, the interior training. Okay? So that was a very hard problem. Uh, the Elman net never did learn this task ever, even with 250,000 distinct distinct strings and 15 hidden units. I, that kept somebody up several nights running that guy. Uh, recurrent cascade correlation, we gave it a fixed set of 256 training strings presented repeatedly, then tested on 256 different strings, 20 runs in all. 
Uh, on 11 of the 20 runs, it uh, produced perfect performance on the training set and perfect performance on the test set that it had not seen, building five to seven hidden units. Okay. The worst performance uh, was 20 errors on the test set of 256 new strings. Single output errors, right? These strings have multiple errors per string, multiple outputs per string. So it was very close to having nailed the thing, but, but didn't quite nail it totally. Uh, at that point, I had to get the paper out to make the uh, neural lips deadline. And, uh, and then the money all got sucked out of the project, and uh, the students had to go find other things, and so did I. So there were a lot of follow-up experiments that I ended up not doing at the time. We're starting to come back to this and play with it again. Uh, the training required on the average of 288 epics, uh, 200,000 string presentations. But Elman Nuts couldn't do it at all. Well, let's need another problem. What about Morse code? Okay, you all know, uh, back in the day people used to know what Morse code was, but have you all heard of this? It's what the telegraph people used to use and the dots and dashes. So suppose we wanted to build a thing that would recognize all, uh, all 26 letters from their Morse code sequences. Okay, now we weren't going to mess with time varying stuff like you have to do in speech. Uh, we just gave it a string of binary inputs. So a dot was the single input network, 26 outputs and an output saying end of a character. Okay, so it's supposed to produce all zeros until the end of the character. Then that end output lights up and one of the 26, whichever one it heard. Okay, that's what we're training it to do. So the letter V, dot, 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 dash, okay, V for victory, V for Beethoven's fifth, dot, 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 da. That's how they used to train people to become telegraphers, uh, is give them mnemonics like that. So one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, then a dash, one, one, zero, longer. And then as soon as you see a second zero in a row, uh, you say, well, okay, it's time to produce the output. We've seen a total character. Okay, so you see what the game is? Uh, at the start of each new letter, when that strobe has gone up and we're starting a new letter, we zero out all the memory. That strobe could be used for that, to say zero the memory next, next time. Okay? All right, so you see what the problem is. We trained one entire set of all 26 alphabetic patterns, all 26 letters, repeatedly, and in 10 trials it learned the task perfectly every time. Uh, it took an average, it built an average of 10.5 hidden units, which is pretty cool because some of these 1-0 sequences are longer than 10. And because it, it doesn't need a hidden unit for each output or for each step in sequence, it's building encodings that are pretty efficient. Okay. Uh, and it was an average of 1,300 passes through the 26 patterns, which is pretty fast. Not in those days, but now it would be. And uh, so that was, that was nice. It was, we were pleased that it could learn that stuff. That was in the paper we sent to Neuralips. Uh, NeurIPS, and then the question came up, could we do this with curriculum training? Suppose, Morse was very clever. Uh, he took the most common English letters, E and T, and gave them the short encodings, one dot or one dash. Okay, and then the next layer of most common ones had two dots and dashes, and so on, up to, I believe, five is the max. So we did the same thing. We took Let's just teach it to recognize E and T. We'll give it that repeatedly, produce the, the right output, and produce the strobe output at the end. Let's just train it that much. Okay, and it learned that. Uh, 
then in increasing sequence length we give it some other groups of characters and train just on those, setting the old ones aside. We don't retrain on E and T, just each new batch. And then at the very end, uh, train on the entire set. So it might be confusing stuff from the first set with stuff from the second. So we have a final training to, to get everything right. Okay, so you can see that training each batch here is going to be quick because they're small batches of examples and it's learning cumulatively. As it's adding hidden units, those get frozen, those stay for the duration. Okay, so the ones that learn to do the E and T you've got forever. Okay, so how did we do? Ran 10 trials, it learned the E and T perfectly with two hidden units usually. Each additional lesson added one or two hidden units. So when you actually present the trial data, is there a sequence of uh, characters, not isolated characters? We showed a whole batch of initially two and then five or six characters in, in those groups. Yeah, but the string that's presented, is it, is it running text or just individual characters? It's individual characters in round robin. You know, we could have scrambled it up. That would have made no difference, I'm sure. Uh, but we did show them. We just marched through the whole set of characters again and again, like some number of times. So, and then when you train the final combination, all of them, all 26 at once, uh, we added two or three more hidden units. You know, this is what's funny, you know, talking about adding two or three and struggling to make it two instead of three when uh, you, you go to any of the deep learning conferences and they're using layers with a billion weights. Uh, Anyway, it added two or three. Uh, overall, ten all ten trials were perfect and on the average created 9.6 hidden units, which is slightly less, very tiny bit slightly less on the average than without the curriculum training. Uh, it required an average of 1,427 epics versus one, three, two, one for all at once training. But these epics are very small, they're like a fifth of the set. Okay, so you can divide that number by five and you're doing a lot better. Uh, and on the average, it saved about 50% in total training time over just training them all in a big batch. Okay, so this is my claim. Again, uh, we wrapped it, we shipped it, we got the, got the paper accepted just in time. And uh, on the average, we saved about 50% of the training time on this. There's a lot more to explore there. Different lesson plans would have done better. Uh, could we use even more complicated sequences, start recognizing English words? Maybe. Uh, so that's as far as we got on this first pass back around 1990, 1991. There are many CASCAR variants possible and a lot of things to explore here that we never got to. Uh, there was something I called Cascade 2. If you're producing one zero outputs classification, you know, it's, it's a white point or a black point. Uh, the covariance measure that we were using to train the, the hidden units uh, worked pretty well. If you're trying to produce a continuous output like predicting tomorrow's stock market from some past history data, it worked better to do something more like backpropagating into the, we used a different training formula, we didn't use the covariance. And that worked better for producing continuous outputs, somewhat. Uh, so we ca I was calling that Cascade 2 as just a different uh, training formula for updating the weights. It tended to produce hidden units that were less saturated, and I think that was the trick, because you want to blend them into a continuous output and not have it be all discretized. Okay, so that's one variant. As I mentioned, we could have mixed types of units in the pool, Gaussian units, edge detection units. There are things built into your eye. There's a famous paper back when I was in grad school called What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain. And a fellow named Jerry Letvin with a bunch of collaborators uh, was actually looking at frog's eyes and what sensors they had in there. And it had center surround sensors like you and me, but it had some very special sensors right in the retina to detect 
small dark dots that are moving. Now, why would that be of interest to a frog? <laughs> okay. And it had another set of units right in the retina to detect substantial changes in contrast to darkness over significant part of the visual field, which is like, right, some predator is now looming over me. And those were right in the retina. So it's cheating, but nature cheats too. Uh, so you can pre-process things to get more meaningful features to the task at hand, or you can have units in the pool that are looking for blobs, if that's what you think the solution is like. Okay. We could even have units that were different kinds of spirals. And boy, would that be good at learning the two spirals problem, but probably not anything else. Maybe detecting cyclones in satellite images. Uh, but you can put in a whole lot of things, train them up. They're all being trained in parallel. You can spread it over 100 machines and see which ones do well. And they get tenure and the others don't. Uh, you can have a mixture of descendant and sibling units. It really bothered some people that we were making the networks deeper and maybe that wasn't always necessary. So you could put in the candidate pool units that were looking at the previous units and units that were just looking at the inputs or only some of the previous units, or only the most recent previous unit, it would either make the network one deeper or look only at the same inputs as the previous guy. So those were sibling units that looked only at the available values so far, but not at what the last added unit was adding. And descendant units were descendants of the last one. It made the network deeper. If you put both of them in the training pool and gave it a small weight saying, other things being more or less equal, prefer not to make the network deeper. That's what it would do, it would not make the network deeper in a lot of cases. It would skip some chances to make the network deeper. Uh, big area to explore there. Uh, mixture of delays and delay types. Uh, well, these single unit delays are nice for Morse code. If it's digitized Morse code, if you want to do, say, speech, I don't know why anyone would want to do that, uh, or detecting sounds, you might, not, might need some variable delays. Okay, it's the same word if I'm speaking very fast or very slow. Okay, so you want something that can stretch. Uh, so you could have units with adjustable delays. You could put in some convolutional stuff. You could actually have convolutional units in the training pool that are very expensive because they're scanning over the whole, uh, the whole input space. But uh, you could have all sorts of things in the candidate pool. There was even a fellow named Tom Schultz at McGill University who got excited about CASCAR. He was a psychologist and was looking at how kids learning a new task get better and better and better and then they hit a plateau. And then there's an aha and suddenly they're a new level. And he thought that was very cascade correlation like, okay, it's training, training, training. Now it's adding a new unit, a new feature. Uh, Anyway, he came up with something he called, uh, I think, knowledge-based cascade correlation, which I didn't like the name, but the idea was to take already trained networks for small tasks and use them as units, put them in the pool and just treat them as units. And uh, there's a couple of papers on that. That's the KBCC. And as we talked about, you can add uh, multiple new units uh, all at once from the pool. If they don't correlate with one another, it might be worthwhile adding more than one. So a lot of big space of possible variants to explore still. Key ideas, build just the structure you need. Don't take a huge block of weights and try to carve out the answer. Take a non-existent block of weights and add things little by little. Uh, as Big Shaw mentioned, uh, things are very much in vogue right now to train a network and then digest away as much as possible. Okay, during training you need all these redundant weights because things are trying to get stuck and the herd effect is going on. Most people don't understand that, but there's, you're not gonna be using those weights efficiently, but after the network is trained, you can do some sensitivity analysis, digest things away, and maybe get something small enough to fit on your cell phone. So it can recognize your face instead of your thumbprint. Okay, Apple has this whole chip in their new phones to to do deep learning, to implement already learned deep learning solutions uh, and recognize certain words and so on. 
I think it's very good at recognizing the word Siri for some reason. Uh, train and add just one unit at a time. Okay, that's where all the power is coming from. Training a big mob of interacting units is just very difficult. It's crazy. They make life hard for each other. They end up doing redundant jobs. Train one at a time, none of that stuff can happen. Okay, so that eliminates all that inefficiency. By freezing the things when you add them, it allows for incremental lesson plan training, curriculum learning. And the unit training and selection is very, very parallelizable. Almost all the weight goes into training the, the candidate pool. And uh, that's 100 different units learning from the same data but not interacting. So that can be spread across many machines, if you like. Uh, and train each new unit to cancel some residual error. As I said, that's the same idea that later became famous as boosting. I didn't, they proved a bunch of convergence theorems I didn't, so they, they, they get the credit for inventing boosting and not me. But this is boosting. Uh, so did you ever try this on the XOR? Because on XOR. Oh yeah, that's the first thing I tried. Yeah. It catches it. Yeah, it adds a unit, now it's done. Almost any unit you add will let you, any hidden unit you add will let you do XOR. It's just you had to warp the space so there's some place you can get. Because in an XOR, if you don't get, you either get the entire problem or you get 50% error, right? Right. Because if you miss one bit, the error is 50%. Right. In that case, the correlation is not going to be. Up. Now, what's hard is like 20 parity because there's no such thing as a partial answer. Right. You can train it the way we train kids. Say, we're going to teach you one par two parity, uh -huh. three parity, four parity. And then it's very easy to train each new unit. But if you just throw 20 parity at the thing, it'll say, what the hell, nothing's, nothing's going on here that makes any sense. Because change any one unit and what the others are doing has to change. There's no neighborhoods. There's no pattern you can zero in on. But if you show it n minus 1 parity all the way down to, to 1. It's incremental training, effectively. That's the only way kids can learn it. That's the only way we humans can learn it. So. Uh, so those are the key ideas. I still have the old code in Common Lisp and in C. I work in Common Lisp, but I had a student uh, translate it into C, and people have used that code, taken it off to industry. Uh, I can make that available to you. Right now I'm working on symbolic knowledge representation, something called the Scone system. It's not deep learning at all. It's not statistical machine learning at all. And the reason I haven't come back to this with a vengeance is that I'm pretty busy with the other thing. But if people want to play with bigger problems, I'm quite happy to advise, collaborate, help to the extent that I can. Might be useful trying this to infer real natural language grammars instead of fake Reber grammars uh, and other deep learning big data problems. Uh, I'm playing around with some ideas for generative models that build up like this. Uh, that do unsupervised learning, things like the Boltzmann machine. Uh, that's all I want to say about it until I see if it's going to work or not. Uh, there are all sorts of ways you can mess around with the memory and delay model. Okay, that single loop delay. Uh, some people wrote a paper and said, oh, well, this is no good because there are finite, very simple finite state machines that this recurrent cascade correlation cannot learn, fundamentally cannot represent. For example, a mod 3 counter with no inputs. It can do multiples of 2 because of the. So we can, give it a, we can give it a 1 unit delay and then a 2 unit delay and a 3 and a 5 and a 7 and you know, cover most of the cases, or you can make an adjustable delay. But that basic recurrent thing, it does have some blind spots. Not ones that come up in the real world, I don't think. But uh, if you really want a mod 3 counter, I can't, uh, I can't train one for you. Uh, and so on. I think you could have convolutional units in the hidden layer. Uh, each one counts as a whole layer in a sense because you want to take the unit and scan it over, over the currently usable space. Uh, and the hope is that this might require less data and much less computation than current deep learning approaches, like by a big factor. But uh, that's the hope. It's not yet demonstrated. So uh, 
That's it. We've got a little time left if there are questions. Yes? Activation functions, what were those? Oh, uh, all I ever used were sigmoids. Okay. As I said, it would be fun to play with Gaussians and some other things. I'm not a big fan of, of ReLUs, uh, you know, with a, a discrete bend, um, just because I think if you're playing with gradients in a space, you know, you don't want harsh edges. Yeah, but uh, potentially yeah, it could have, the pool could just have different activations. Yeah, you, you, could, you could put in, if it's rel use, you can't use quick prop to train them, that's all. Because it's not doubly differentiable system. Rel u is just zero and then the input is either the input if it's positive or zero otherwise. Okay, it's a cheap way of doing something kind of like a sigmoid. Uh, and it's cheaper computationally, but uh, it's only singly differentiable. It's got a step. It being a whole lot more powerful. So the point is, uh, we can see that if you uh, the choice of activation, yeah, makes a huge difference to the size of the network you can run. So with right. reduce, for instance, the networks tend to be much smaller. And uh, so in this situation, kind of situation, I could imagine that the activation function doesn't have to be a design choice. It could be something the algorithm chooses because your pool could just have different activations. Yeah, that's, that's what I say there on the slide. Uh, put a whole mixture of different kinds of units and uh, previous slide. Uh, previous, previous slide. Mixed unit types in the pool. See what gets chosen. Whoever's, whoever's doing the best job gets tenure. Uh, modulo politics. <laughs> yes? Incremental learning in what sense? Yeah, if I suppose if you got off on a wrong path. Now, the subsequent units can ignore that guy if he's, you know, doing something crazy. And they, they have the option of just looking at, if, if they can increase their correlation score just by looking at the raw inputs, just ignore this one. Well, they did something that you thought was useful. Okay, they, they were correlating with some component of the error. Now, if subsequent units have no use for that feature, they're just paying no attention to that part of the feature space. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. And uh, if anybody wants to look, the, the papers are online. If anybody wants to look at the code, we can talk. And uh, if anyone think, wants to. Recurrent uh, problems that require, require recurrence is a, is a huge open area where you, where you can possibly get a lot of. Right. You know, so what I what I made some notes on at the time, and those are the notes that got lost in these frequent moves to larger disks. Uh, I don't know right now what units are being built by the Morse code thing. I don't know what each of those units is doing. But even when we were, when we were looking at the, at the, at the parallel Weber grammars, this is a, that's the kind of problem that we actually discussed in class. Yeah. For instance, if you are trying to interpret code. Yes. Every time you see an open brace, you have to remember it till it's closed. Right. That's the kind of structure that standard recurrent, recurrent models we know are not good at doing. But it's something of this kind, actually, I learned to. So we showed in the compound Reber grammar with the P and the T at the start and at the end. We showed it was able to retain state across a confusing gap of arbitrary length. So, I mean, now, so that's, that's in there possibly. Would it do better with something like an explicit LSTN unit? Well, there's nothing stopping these units from being switching units. That's the point. There's nothing to stop them from doing. We could have memory array, array units. We could have LSTM, LSTM units. Yeah. Uh, that's something I think that's there's, there's a whole lot of and variable delay units that are looking for signal processing kind of features. Uh, you know, this is an interesting part of the space to explore. And, uh, you know, right now there's this gold rush in the other part of the space. So, uh, I think there's some cheap publications that's waiting to happen out there. 
you know, people who hear about this say, oh my God, you know, where's that been hiding? And it's been, been sitting there in the literature, in the NIPS proceedings uh, for 30 years. That paper got a lot of citations initially. I think it's got, there were sort of two versions of it, the tech report and the, the version at NIPS. I think between them they have like 5,000 citations or something. And then it's been completely forgotten. All, all the people doing deep learning now have no idea that this is even out there, except friends of mine who I've beat over the head with this. Yes? Have you heard of a compositional network? Compositional? Pattern-based networks. No, I have not. Uh, so based on genetics, yeah, send me the pointer if you would. Uh, there are certainly people trying all kinds of crazy units in fixed architectures. They, they weren't fixed though. Okay, so if they're building them up, you know, it's, it, it's a wheel. People are going to reinvent it if they don't know about this one, you know. Uh, I mean, the key insight is, hey, what if we just trained one unit at a time, and then you realize you maybe need a pool to do well and that that pool could have lots of stuff in it, lots of options in it. Uh, so it's not like this is, you know, something that if I hadn't been around, nobody would ever have discovered. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if people have reinvented it, but I, I wasn't aware of that. Consider the fact that uh, we basically know from these experiments 30 years ago now, or 25 years ago? 30. 29. Actually, that, that you have a much smaller optimal network hidden in a much larger network. Uh, when uh, so, you know, comparing the results Scott has with what nine new, nine neurons versus what hundreds of thousands of guys, that's something that we've known. But then someone rediscovered it earlier this year. Right. Got a nice paper award for it. Well, and of course <laughs> the of course the problem with training the unit and then digesting it away is that you're spending all the cost of training the damn thing. And then as you digest it away, uh, you're hurting, you're trying to digest it in a way that doesn't hurt the performance too badly. And then if you retrain it, maybe it will, you'll get back what you lost by taking some of the structure out that didn't seem to be useful. But uh, to me, it's not an attractive approach. Uh, it's attractive enough that thousands of people are working on it, so uh, you know, we'll see where they get to. And I don't need to. I don't need to think about that because lots of other people are doing it. This semester we were kind of unfortunate in that Scott was on vacation early in the semester, so we usually do this lecture somewhere between week four and week, week five, and we have a few student teams who want to come in. You know, yeah. Stay in there. Although they fade away for some reason or the other, we've had a couple who stayed. A couple who got it running on various architectures and so on, uh, yeah. but no, nobody really actually investigated. Uh, yeah. Structures. Well, Some there are. Just using an LSTM within the LSTM cell within the cascade code. There are a bunch of good senior theses or master's theses in here. If anybody wants to talk, I'm happy to talk. Right, so uh, something just as trivially simple as uh, cascade code with an LSTM unit. Term projects, maybe, but there's a hump to get over, and no, previous so previous entrants project. haven't gotten over the hump. You know, just to get it running and try it out on the simple things. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, enjoy the rest of the course. Yes. <laughs>